Greetings, dear listeners. This is Jonah Goldberg, host of the Remnant Podcast, brought to you by the Dispatch and Dispatch Media. In the grand tradition of this podcast, counter-programming against breaking news, um, we're going to not talk about the Trump uh, arrest at all, which is transpiring as we speak. Um, instead, we are going to, first and foremost, right a historic wrong. Um, uh, of my AEI colleagues that I should have had on the podcast much earlier, um, Rick Hess is probably at the top of the list. If for among, I wouldn't say if for no other reason, I would say among re, among the many reasons why that's the case is he's a good talker. He knows an enormous amount about his field. Um, but also if AI were a prison, he runs one of the most powerful prison gangs at AI and everyone gives him a wide berth in the cafeteria. Um, and you, and, and if he wants to use the weight bench in the yard, you just let him. So, um, with that said, Frederick Hess is a senior fellow at AI. He's the director of our education policies, um, where he works on K through 12 and higher ed issues. He's the founder and chairman of AI's conservative education reform network. Um, he writes for Forbes and, um, and he's the executive editor of education next. He's got a new book. He writes many books. He's written more books than I have. Uh, the Great School Rethink, Reimagining K-12 through Education After the Pandemic. Rick, welcome to The Remnant. Hey, thanks, Jonah. Great to be with you, man. So um, the first question I always ask authors is, what's your book about? I want to go global on some education stuff, but it, it, this is, might as well be the right way to enter it. So what's your book about? It's about education stuff. Um, you know, I, I've been doing this for, I don't know, pushing on three decades and most of my professional career has been watching would-be reformers try to pick up big sticks and beat schools into a different shape. And what's remarkable right now coming out of the pandemic is for the first time, I think in decades, you've got the sense that lots of parents and communities and teachers actually want something to work different than it's been working. And that opens the door to asking a whole bunch of important questions about what the hell we're doing with kids' time in school all day what the heck teachers are doing and how we're using teachers, why we're using technology the way we're using it, um, how we should think about choice and the relationship with parents. And so this book was my best effort to try to offer some, I don't know, constructive guidance on how to think about the opportunities here. All right, so we'll, we'll talk about the opportunities in just two seconds. But it's an interesting point as a pundit, amidst all of the craziness with the school board meetings and the pandemic stuff and all that, one of the theories that people like me trotted out a lot was because it jibed with my own experience with my daughter is a lot of parents were exposed because of the remote learning to what their kids were actually learning. And I think that's one of the reasons why, I mean, the pandemic made people crazy in all sorts of ways, but like exposure to like some of the race stuff um, and uh, you know, broadly speaking um, and some of the other sort of the other stuff on the curriculum were like, you're learning about what you're doing, what Cause they could overhear it while they were making dinner or whatever. Is there, is that quantifiable? Is that right? Is that just, you know, or, or were there other things at work that, you know, are less obvious? Yeah. So, I mean, I, it's, it's tough to quantify. I mean, you what's interesting is parents relationship to schools is a lot like voters relationship with Congress uh, for half a century. Um, parents say they love their kids' schools and they hate America's schools as a whole. Right. Very much like I love my congressman, I hate Congress. So you ask parents, even now, after all of the craziness the last couple of years, 77, 75% will give their kids public school in A or B, even though only 20% of American adults think schools are going the right direction. Um, but this is a longstanding phenomenon. So I think one, one thing is you're absolutely right. Um, you know, can't, can't even recall how many parents we like, I can't believe the stuff I saw when I was trying to help my kid and what the teacher had in the background. That's one part of it. A second part of that was this was actually American public education putting its worst foot forward because, um, you know, the killing of George Floyd happened in spring 2020, right as the pandemic kicked in. And both K-12 and higher ed, you saw this enormous rush to virtue signal. And so a lot of that stuff was half-baked and reaching for the nearest ed school kind of DEI instructor in, available. And if if the pandemic had hit 12 months earlier, I think people would have seen less craziness um, than they wound up seeing. But the biggest thing, I think, which frames all that, is schools have this custodial relationship with parents. Um, if you take your kid to the school bus stop each day and the kid gets on the bus 
and your kid comes home safe at the end of the day and seems to have friends and finds teachers they like and isn't getting bullied, most parents, turns out, cut the schools a lot of slack. They figure out if the kids are safe and reasonably happy, they kind of just trust that the schools are taking care of the academic stuff. And what happened when schools suddenly said to parents, dude, you're on your own. You've got to be homework monitor and you've got to do IT and we're going to put up some asynchronous you know, instruction once in a while, figure it out. Suddenly stripped of that kind of custodial trust, a lot of parents started asking other questions and a bunch of other stuff that had been just looked past suddenly was exposed. Yeah, I mean, uh, my earlier prison joke notwithstanding, the I think one of the things that a lot of people have never really appreciated about the value that a lot of parents have about schools is is the prison effect, right? It's like, I, I've locked them away someplace where I know they are safe for the most part, and where I know there are responsible adults I can yell at if something goes wrong, so let me go do my other stuff. And when you undo that it you, you don't know all the stuff psychologically and otherwise that is hiding behind that door and you just open it up and people are gonna have, oh my gosh you know it's like you open up that the forbidden closet of mystery and all this stuff pours out and you're like i didn't know this stuff was in there you know you know i mean it's the thing right if you send your kid to school um you know our kid we got we got we got little kids right they leave for school at 7 30 in the morning they get home at 3 30 in the afternoon that's eight hours here I am. I'm a guy with like a PhD in this stuff. I've taught this at universities. I have no earthly idea what's happening during this 480 minutes for the most part. And so for parents who actually have real jobs, who don't think deeply about this stuff and don't have the time or inclination to, there's a huge amount of trust built in. One of the things that I just heard over and over from folks during the pandemic was they're like, what the hell are kids doing all day? The teachers seem to be, you know, L.A., they put teachers on a three-hour workday for full salary a week and a half into the... It, they didn't say, you know, text each of your students every day. They didn't say, make sure you're available for families who want to reach out. They said, you've got a three-hour workday. And I think you saw that kind of phenomenon over and over. You couple that with like the frustration about the ideological stuff, about schools seeming nuts, and you had just this general sense that this institution, which we just assumed was doing its job, uh, we, you know, as a parent, suddenly I'm looking at it in a, in a very different light. All right. So I think this is one question I've always just sort of wanted to ask you, and then we'll get back into the wonkery. But, uh, it reminds me, you know, I was a little R policy gnome RA in the nineties at AI. And I remember when Judge Bork got jury duty. And I just always loved the idea of being like some, you know, district attorney, assistant district attorney in DC having to voir dire or whatever, Robert Bork, right? <laughs> when you go to parent-teacher conferences, do the teachers just run and hide um, for fear of having to talk to you about this kind of stuff? No, they got no idea who I am. They're like, <laughs> here's this knucklehead who doesn't, you know, doesn't speak nearly as well as his lawyer wife. And they just kind of look at Jolene and I just kind of am there for the ride. Okay, fair enough. All right, so... I care about, obviously I care about education, kids of the future, all the cliches, all that kind of stuff. But one of the reasons why, unlike some other public policy, you know, it's, I'm, 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 I'm sort of a jack of all trades, master of none kind of guy. I, I, I'm interested in a lot of things, but I've never really engaged that much with education stuff in part because it seems like it's one of these areas where people actually know what to do. The problem isn't and I'm, I'm asking it this way so you can correct me, but like, it isn't so much that they don't know what to do. It's that there are things other than best practices for education that are stopping best practices for education, right? So it's sort of like in the military, it's, it's less about finding new knowledge and new strategies and that kind of thing. It's more about teaching the right skills. I mean, I think teaching is a real skill. It's sort of like being a soldier, there's just like specific skills you need to have. And some people are going to be better at it than others and all that kind of stuff, but you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And, um, and I get very frustrated when people talk about education stuff, because I think education schools are basically guilds that are contrary to the public interest. Have there been like, like it's sort of like Elaine's thing on Seinfeld where she loves stuffed crust pizza. Cause she's like, they're going to, it's going to be decades before they find a new place to put pe- cheese on a pizza. Has there been actual, an actual breakthrough in teaching kids in a, in a specific way that actually improved outcomes that we didn't know about 30 or 40 or 50 years ago? 
um, in terms of, of like success in the actual classroom? So, so it's such a great question. So much of this for, for your real geeks in the audience out there. J.Q. Wilson wrote about this at length in bureaucracy. He talked, in fact, about, right, the, the military, prisons, and schools. As right. These institutions, it's a great book. Deep yeah. craft knowledge. Um, so, so there's a couple things going on. One is that we know what works in the sense that almost anywhere in this country, you can go find a school that the parents think is doing great stuff for the kids, where the educators know what they're doing. It really clicks. And the, the, the really weird thing is you can find schools that are doing this in pretty traditional ways and also in a whole bunch of eclectic ways. The real problem is that when you try to take what's working in one site and then replicate it, we've got an abysmal record. So there was, in fact, the whole research literature in this. Back, the U.S. Department of Education was started in 79 because Jimmy Carter had promised the NEA on the campaign trail. Um, but before there was a Department of Ed, uh, the, the, uh, Federal Institute for Education, I think it was called, gave the Harvard professor, Ron Edmonds, millions of dollars uh, to figure out what works. It was called the What Works Research. Um, and Edmonds and a bunch of researchers spent years and they figured out the things that made effective schools. Um, they were using formative assessment. This means you test kids every so often, not to just grade how much they know, but to figure out what to teach them. And they had professional cultures and they had and then they tried to replicate this stuff, and it turns out that it was like building a sandcastle kind of at, high, at, at you know, low tide at the beach. You would do all this training, do all this stuff, and then six months later, you would go back and it had all been washed away. And this is pretty much the history of school reform through like this entire post-nation or risk era. We keep coming up with these interesting ideas, and none of these ideas actually seem to stick of their own volition. Well, that's, that's partly where No Child Left Behind and Race to the Top and all these big policy fights uh, of our time have come. So is there anything that we didn't know? No. Like even the reading science, uh, the science of reading stuff that's been so in the news of late, we've pretty much had a good idea that kids need to know stuff like phonics and phonemic awareness and deco these fancy words. Um, and we've known this for a f several decades. And the big problem is A, to get folks to want to do it, and then B, to get them to actually do it well. And that's part of, I think, what makes education so insanely frustrating for people compared to like um, a monetary policy or foreign and defense. There, a lot of it is figuring out what the strategy is. In education, it's figuring out what the strategy is. And then even if you get the strategy right, it turns out it's not like the last mile problem. It's like this huge, enormous gulf to cross between even getting the ideas right to having them work the way they're supposed to for kids. And so just... I mean, you got to work with these people. So, but then again, that's what you get paid for. <laughs> Am I being unfair to the education school, com you know, industrial complex? It, it, is there a, is there a value add, a redeeming value add for education schools that I'm missing? No, hardly any. Um, I mean, I, I'd say this <laughs> as, you know, I, I got one degree from the Harvard Graduate School of Ed. I've taught at the UPenn School of Ed and the Harvard School of Ed. And, um, you know, I mean, there, there are smart people in these places. Uh, look, you know, there's a whole bunch of lunatics, but there's also some really smart people who I respect and I think add value individually. Um, as entities, uh, the whole business of teacher licensure, I think, is enormously problematic. Um, it gets defended on the same turf that, look, we license engineers and physicians. We ought to license teachers, except that, you know, we license engineers and physicians because we believe there's certain predicate knowledge that you need to know where a kidney is in order to, like, Turns out that the analogs in education are like, you ought to know what you're teaching. But the people in ed schools will tell you, that's not what we're worried about. We're worried about empathy and connectivity and emotional intelligence. In which case, it's a lot more like journalism school or business school, where tr good training can help. But nobody says you have to get a journalism degree or a business degree before you're allowed to apply for a job. So partly you've got this ed school cartel that has made teaching harder to get into, more expensive and deterred lots of good folks. And then you've got this entire apparatus of ideologically flavored research, um, which I think is on the balance. A lot of it has been enormously harmful for real schools and real families. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've always thought the comparison to journalism school was the best one. I mean, like business school, this P&L statements, I and mean, I've learned now that I'm running a startup or co-founding a startup, there's stuff I don't know, right? You know, but like journalism school, 
you know, my dad, who was a longtime editor, um, probably had 2000 writers for him working for him as a new, running a new syndicate. He hated journalism schools and he was always, he'd always say, you know, look, I got to send a correspondent to Russia. Who am I going to send? Like someone who majored in the Russian language or someone who studied Russian history or study someone who studied journalism. Right. And it's like, I can teach the journalism. Like that's not the hard part. I mean, they have to be able to write, but other than that, that's not that hard either. Um, knowing the stuff about that you're teaching or that you're writing about is more important than how to write a nut graph or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. And it's that, it, it, that's why I call it a guild. I mean, like the most valuable thing about going to Columbia journalism schools is that there are a thousand editors out there who went or a hundred editors out there who went to Columbia journalism school. They wear the same signet ring and they're like, you know, they want to protect the value of the brand that they invested in. And I don't think it makes journalism better. And I don't think it's, and I've never seen anything, any proof. I mean, my Steve Hayes, my colleague who helped find the thing, I give him crap about going to Columbia Journalism School all the time, but he basically agrees with me. It's a, they're places for an ideological indoctrination more than they are um, places that really expand or improve journalism. And it feels like that about education. It's like every time I read anything about education schools, it feels more like, oh, this is the Petri dish where a lot of these crazy ideas come from rather than like they figured out actually how to help people. Yeah, no, I think that's right. You know, there's the, the Arthur Bester wrote this devastating takedown of ed schools in the 1950s called Educational Wastelands. So one, this has been with us for a very long time. One of the problems is that ed schools don't actually have an organizing discipline. So ed schools are this potpourri of sociologists and economists and psychologists. And so, and so what are the rules? What are the intellectual rules for what's a good idea? And everybody brings their own kind of kit. But, you know, maybe the biggest thing is, especially when it gets to leadership, um, you know, I, I used to teach at, uh, in Houston started this alternative leadership licensure program at the Rice Graduate School in the business school. So I taught there and it was interesting because there you had students who wanted to be school principals or superintendents and they were sitting side by side with folks who were studying, you, you know, uh, folks who wanted to run nonprofits or go into oil and gas. But. That is a one in a million. Almost every one of America's like principals and associate superintendents and superintendents, all 400,000 of these people have done all of their leadership and professional and management training in schools of education. So there is just an enormous bubbling around what ideas are permissible in terms of pedagogy, in terms of ideology, in terms of how you think about finances. And I think that's just had devastating effects for our ability to have, you know, constructive conversations about what would it mean for schools to actually change the way they do business. All right. So that's a good segue, you know, because in the book, you talk about the importance of quote unquote, rethinking the education system and its policies, but without a political bias. So like, what does that mean? I mean, I mean, you've always been sort of critical of this, of sort of top down stuff from Washington. What does rethinking mean if it's, uh, is it just a thousand flowers bloom and how does that sort of work? Sure. Um, and, you know, and partly, and, and, and I, you know, I'll even let others, I don't even claim to be without bias or neutral. You know, I'm, I'm a conservative guy and I come at it from certain intellectual predilections. But, you know, part of this has been in education um, because, you know, education has this weird problem that it attracts people who are hugely passionate about it. The Teach for America crowd and funders who really believe in what they're doing. Just like journalism. And on the one hand, this is a great thing, you know, especially when you're like, you know, at a gate delay at an airport, and you're like wishing the agent actually showed a little passion. But the problem is that passionate people tend to be very self-assured. And so what's happened is, at least for my professional life, ed reform has been defined by, let's figure out the answer and rush and go do it. And if it doesn't work, we'll try something else. Rethinking for me starts by actually making sure we know what the hell the problem is we're trying to solve. So let me give you a real simple one. Um, New Mexico, a couple of weeks ago, just ex um, voted to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to extend their school year by two weeks. Um, this is the kind of thing that tends to get bipartisan support. Um, it's expensive. It locks kids up for an extra 10 days in school. Um, faculty have to work an extra two weeks. But you're like, well, we need more time in school. Here's the thing. Um, U.S. kids actually spend from grades K to 9, 100 hours a year more in school than the OECD median. 
Uh, you'll hear all the time that our kids don't spend as much time in school as their peers. But while, say, the Finns have a 190-day school year, they have a shorter school day, and that 190 days is optional. Most Finnish schools go more like 160, 170. We tend to go 180. In fact, our kids spend a lot of time in school, 1,080 hours. The question is, what's actually happening with this time? And on this, it's actually astonishing how little even data-driven reformers or superintendents who talk all day about test scores, how little they can tell you about what kids are doing with that time. So some folks at Columbia University back in 2015 just took a sample district in Massachusetts, broke it down. Of that 1,076 hours the kids were in school, only 640 for, for instruction. So 430 hours were going to all kinds of other stuff. Um, it was a high school, so when the 10th graders were getting tested, 9th, 11th, and 12th graders were just sitting there twiddling their thumbs. Because God forbid you teach them if you're not teaching the 10th graders. Uh, there were exam days at the end of each semester. There were early release days. There were announcements. Turns out that on top of that, a guy named Matt Kraft at Brown University went into the Providence schools a couple, uh, couple years ago. And they tracked that the average Providence Rhode Island classroom had 2,000 interruptions a year. That was 10 to 20 instructional days, two to four weeks. So New Mexico just paid hundreds of millions of dollars to buy two weeks to have kids sit in disorganized classrooms in all likelihood. If they simply had reduced the amount of disorder by half, you probably reclaim much or all of that time if it looks anything like Providence. And Providence is a, a disorderly system, but there's no reason to think that it's a massive outlier. So part, so well, for me, the rethinking begins, for instance, not with more spending or with extending the school day or school year or with new mandates, but actually by figuring out what the hell is it that we've got kids and teachers doing all day in school and then asking, how do we organize that time so kids spend more time on things that matter, whether that's having recess and actually running around or whether it's in good conversations, but so that it's not sitting there kind of shooting looks back and forth while they're waiting for a minute and a half for the teacher to unlock the door, let the kid in and get everybody settled back to task. Yeah, so just on this guilting as it just came into my head, one of the formative experiences for me about having palpable disdain for the education industrial complex was, you probably remember this better than I do, was when the, during that time in the 90s with the peace dividend stuff, we were downsizing the military and you had all of these non-coms, you know, these like, like 10 year sergeants in the Marines and the, in the army. And there was this idea, particularly for inner city schools that were lacking male teachers, male role models to have these really tough, serious discipline, um, guys come in and, and teach school. And I remember the explosion of op-ed saying, Oh no, 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 you can't do that. You can't do that. They have to go to ed school. They have to get certified as teachers and all that kind of stuff. The idea that some tech sergeant from the Marines couldn't go into a 10th grade classroom in South LA and teach math, right? I mean, or teach whatever, you know, and have better results um, than the, the generic teacher in there. It just seemed to me so laughably wrong. Um, but it's, it's this sort of mindset that we have to protect our, our chunk. You respond to that, but everyone always talks about how bad schools are. Right. And I know we've drifted downwards recently and some test scores and stuff. But when I used to look into this stuff for Ben Wattenberg again back in the 90s and whenever I sort of check in on it, there's always some games that people play with the stats. Right. And so like one of the things that was always very common where they would take the aggregate school performance numbers for America and compare them to, say, South Korea, where and they measured against just against college bound kids and the so we're taking the, the, the average for American test scores and comparing it to the test scores or the, te the educational results for the elites who are going to school. And we look bad on that. Um, I don't know if that's still a common practice, but like, where are we in terms of internet? You mentioned the OECD averages. Where are we in comparison to like peer countries overall? You know, the most egregious version of this is when they do like the PISA, it's Beijing, it's China. So they test the children of like the ruling elite and they like come out at the top of the charts and we go, oh my gosh, the Chinese schools are working so well. Um, wh where are we? Um, you know, we tend to be reasonably middling. Um, and it's, it, you, you know, there's a lot that's going on in these numbers. One thing, you'll get these stories about how American schools used to be the best in the world a century ago and they've gotten worse. And that just, we have no earthly idea. Nobody, nobody, you can't, 
You can't say that, but you can't disprove it. Um, nobody had any meaningful international test till about six countries, several in Western Europe and us in the late 50s. They had a tiny little thing, but you don't really have that kind of test date until the 1990s. So anybody who's trying to make assertions about what our schools looked like a century ago is, you know, basically uh, paddling upstream. Uh, and people also forget that, you know, say in 1900, only about one kid out of 16 graduated high school in the U.S. Um, the notion that everybody would graduate high school is really a post-World War II phenomenon. Uh, it wasn't until 1970 that 90% of kids were showing up at school each day. So when, you know, when you, when people think back to, oh, in 1900, you know, the typical student could uh, graduate, high school graduate could speak Latin. <laughs> yeah, but that's like looking at the top 6% of graduates in Maryland or Virginia and then saying, um, so how do we fare internationally? You know, the, the, the reality is we tend to be middle of the pack. Um, it's hard to know exactly what's going on uh, in, in terms of the testing protocols that they're utilizing in all of these nations. Uh, a lot of these nations track. And then there's questions about, um, you know, are they actually testing uh, uniformly across the tracks, um, you know, tracking high achievers, middle achievers, low achievers, particularly when you get to nations that use exams uh, to get into secondary school or to qualify for post, uh, for post second, for, for, for college. And then in the U.S., I mean, basically what we saw was we saw reading and math scores go up in the decade after No Child Left Behind. Um, from about 2000, 2010, there was uh, a substantial improvement. Uh, nobody ever quite figured out how much of this was gaming, that schools were teaching twice as much reading and math and less recess and doing less civics. And so kids had higher reading and math scores versus how much was actual improvement. Then starting about 2010, you saw this flatlining. Um, across the board. And what you've seen, um, and especially in stuff like history and civics over the last eight or 10 years, is a pronounced decline that's grown worse during the pandemic. Um, so the bottom line is, you, you know, there's no way to argue that our schools are doing especially well. And certainly if you look across the U.S., we're doing lousier than we were a decade ago. Let's say, I mean, other than turning out the lights, let's say you're made Secretary of Education and uh, the President and Congress indicate that they're not going to give you everything, but they're going to give you most of one, most of your top three. What are the things you emphasize that you prioritize? The reason I ask it like that is because it's not a genie question, right? It's not snap your fingers and you get it. Like in the realm of the doable, what would you prioritize to get through the bureaucracy and actually make in terms of a real reform? Yeah. And, you know, in education, one of the things, you know, the Washington only spends 10% of the money on K-12 education. So a lot of this is about trying to attach strengths. But in terms of directionality, if you're trying to attach strength, one is to just radically expand the choices available to folks. Um, school choice uh, has been in the middle of the American Ed conversation since 1990, uh, when the Milwaukee Voucher Program started. The first charter schools were 91 in Minnesota. Um, but for most of that time, edu a a school choice has been more Medicaid than Medicare. Uh, it is centered on trying to help Low-income kids trapped in awful schools get to better schools. What changed during the pandemic was suddenly when all of these families had their schools locked down, they said, we want options. And families tried these learning pods and they tried micro schools. And now what you see is 70% of adults, 70% of parents say they support pretty much choice across the board. And what that, what, what that, that's a good thing. Choice should not just be about rescuing your kid from an awful school. It should be about changing school if that doesn't work. But if you, if you've got a long term sub who can't teach French and you can get powerful online Mandarin lessons, why the hell are we actually tying schools or parents' hands? So one, radically expanding choice, not just school choice, but these other forms of educational choice kind of captured by these education savings accounts. A uh, second thing is we've added administrators at an ungodly rate in education. A lot of this is to do with compliance burdens. Um, District level staffing is up 93% since No Child Left Behind. Kids are up 5%. Um, school level administrators are up 40%. Kids are up 5%. Um, if you just took back uh, administrative staffing levels to the level they were when George Bush was president, uh, you would save uh, billions of dollars, which could be reallocated uh, either into compensating people who actually do the work or into at a minimum, you would actually start to reduce justice oversight load, which drives everybody in these systems crazy. 
And look, and the third thing is, um, I think we need to set new norms on how schools interact with parents. And here's Washington can play a huge role, as we saw when the NSBA wrote this letter asking the FBI to treat parents as domestic terrorists. Um, what happened was actually it was it was an unanticipated consequence of a big victory. Back in the '90s, when I used to like substitute, when I used to uh, supervise student teachers up in Boston, it was no trick at all to find a uh, teacher who would say, "I can't teach that kid." It was class, it was race, it was neighborhood, it was access, it was all this stuff. Um, over the last 20 years, a bipartisan coalition kind of established a norm that the job of a professional educator is to try to educate every kid and not to make excuses. Doesn't mean they can or will, but it means that they've got to do their job. And that was a hugely powerful victory for this kind of Bush, Obama, Clinton kind of coalition. The problem with it, though, is we got so caught up in not making excuses that it has become toxic for principals or governors or school leaders to say parents have to do their part. So if you say, look, you know, parents have to take their kids' devices away at night. They got to make them do homework. They got to get them to school on time. Um, you're at very high risk of being called a racist or an enemy of equity or insufficiently attuned to the risks in the neighborhood. And this is a little bit like you take your kid to the pediatrician and she says, Rick, you know, Blake's looking a little heavy. Uh, you got to stop giving him junk food. And I take him home and I give him a bag of Doritos. We don't say my pediatrician's a bad pediatrician. We say she's got to do her job, but her job has got to be in partnership with the parent. And we've totally lost sight of that. And one of the powerful things we could do about setting guidance, norms, legal expectations is reestablishing what a healthy partnership between educators and parents needs to look like on both sides. I, I want to return to choice in a second, but I want to ask basically the same question, but now you've been in charge of a, a median school district in a median state. And now you have, it's not about, it's, it's, it's how you're going to spend your share of the 90% of the dollars that aren't federal. Um, and you can actually fire people and that kind of thing. Uh, First thing is folks, you know, folks generally underestimate how much we spend on education. Most Americans say we should spend more. Across the country, median per pupil spending is about $18,000 a year. Um, it's doubled per pupil after inflation since nation at risk. New York City this year, spending $38,000 per child. So what would I do? Look, the, the, the most important thing I think you can do as a school leader is attract uh, talented educators and then use them wisely. Problem is we've doubled the number of teachers relative to the number of kids since the 1970s, which means you need twice as many bodies, which makes it hard to recruit selectively and it makes it hard to pay well. So I would take median district has about uh, 16 kids for each teacher. I would take it back to where we were in the 70s, about 27 to one. This is not class size. Class sizes wouldn't actually change dramatically. Um, if you do this median teacher in America, so in a median district, uh, you can pay about $140,000 uh, per teacher per year. So average salary becomes $140,000. You only need to hire about 55% as many teachers so you can keep your strongest half. Second thing I would say is what are we doing with these teachers? When you actually look at how teachers spend their day, you have terrific instruction, uh, instructional uh, educators who are only spending 50 to 60% of their day actually teaching. They're spending a lot of time watching kids in the hallway, unloading buses, watching kids eat jello in the cafeteria. So there's a question here about how do we do this in a architectural firm, in a law firm, in a medical practice? How do we think about getting cheaper support staff to take some of the routine stuff off their plate so that we can have fewer teachers, but they don't have to work there all that much harder? They're just spending their time doing what matters. And then the third thing is I would actually make sure that we were thinking real smart about technology because, you know, we all lived through this pan pandemic. Technology is schools are ultimately about human connection. And good technology is when it creates opportunities for kids to connect with people they hadn't connected with before, to get more support from teachers, uh, to get access to information they need. Bad technology is when you tell kids to stare at screens and you shut off their mics and they shut off the cameras. And part of this is we get so caught up in going one-to-one -one devices and spending money on Chromebooks and bragging about like how high tech we are, that there is almost no kind of grounded understanding of what is it 
that a good organization uses technology to do and what it should be about. And it, it is good technology should let teachers spend more time putting a time, putting a hand on a kid's shoulder because the routine stuff's getting automated and moved out of the middle. And instead, what's happening is in lots of schools, teachers, good teachers are in a room with kids and the kids are staring at screens while the teacher wanders around. And that seems to get us further and further from any kind of kind of healthy construction of the schoolhouse. So we are going to get to the choice stuff, but as someone who's watched every five years, some new technological silver bullet turn out to be at best a lead bullet. <laughs> um, um, and, uh, and, you know, some of the most expensive paperweights in human history have been bought for schools in terms of like Chromebooks and all that kind of stuff. With that skepticism in mind, where do you come down on, are you hopeful about the AI stuff? Are you wait and see? Um, or are you worried? Somewhere between wait and see and worried. Um, I, I, you know, y- y- if you read like the stuff I've got to read, all the education media, there's lots of pie in the sky stuff about how AI is going to be great. But the problem is it could be great if teachers are making sure kids are using it in ways that are developing skills. Problem is, teachers don't have any idea how to do this, have got no training in doing this. Kids are really good at outsourcing their work to the easiest thing at hand. So cutting and pasting from Wikipedia when that's at hand. And if, unless you set really clear guardrails and expectations, that's what's going to tend to happen. If, if, if I, if you don't mind, I mean, I thought about this, I, you know, cause you're, 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 you're so spot on on like ed tech. I mean, it's funny. You go back to the 1800s, there's this stuff when the, 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 there was marketing materials for the erasable pencil that education would never <laughs> be the same because kids would no longer fear making mistakes and blah, blah, blah. I, 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 you know, in the book I talk about, I say, you know, a lot of folks who are listening may remember some of this buzz around the flipped classroom over the last 10 years, the Khan Academy that saw concrete and this idea that kids could learn at home and then go in and discuss it in school. And I say the flipped classroom is great. Problem is, we've actually been doing it for five centuries. The original tech to flip the classroom was the book. Like, instead of only hearing what your teacher could tell you, you'd go home and you'd read, and then you'd come in and discuss it. Problem is, if you spend any time visiting schools, you go into a classroom, and you'll see even 500 years later, teachers will ask kids to read at home. They won't trust they read it. So then they'll spend all day having the kids read paragraphs aloud instead of discuss it. These technologies, it's not just what can it do. But what's it being used to do? And that's, again, you know, your point about you, you asked before about the ed schools. Um, ed schools should be in the business of training folks to think about how do you integrate tech in a way that actually creates the kinds of teaching and learning we want to see. Um, I do an annual survey of the 200 most influential education researchers in the country. Uh, I believe last year of the 200, one of them studied education technology. Yeah. So like, well, I, I, I don't want to continue venting about the ed schools. I think people know where I'm coming from on that. But all right. So on the, on the choice thing, which might actually get us back to the ed schools, because they're sort of the magnet next to the compass and all this stuff. But so I know you're, I you mean, you're in favor of choice. Um, I'm in favor of choice for just basic liberal reasons, right? You know, classical liberal reasons. Um, at the same time, I have school choice, right? Like I sent my kid to private school. Um, we only had one. So we could make it work and it was crazy expensive. I didn't like in retrospect, I think we sent her to the wrong high school. Um, but there is literally not a, with possibly exception of like a couple Catholic kind of places and that kind of thing. There is not a private school in the, in the DC area, not counting TJ that isn't profoundly left of center. And, um, I'm not saying they're all bad at, bad at teaching because that's one of the things that people hate to hear um, on in right-wing audiences. It's like, yeah, the New York Times is left to center. It's also a good newspaper, right? Um, uh, Georgetown uh, Day in Washington, D.C. is wildly left-wing. It also has really good results in teaching kids. Um, it's just that they also add on, they, they, they preload other things in there. Um, but if you talk to your average right-wing audience, right, like... Uh, when I was at National Review, you go on a cruise and they say, we need school choice to fight political correctness. And the sad fact of it is in part because what you're getting at before about people go into education, they do it because they're passionate. They don't 
just go into public education because they're passionate. They also go into private education because they're passionate. And there was not a private school I that we could find that for high school in the DC area that wasn't going to be to one extent or another, for want of a better term, woke. And, you know, my daughter spent her junior or senior year having to ex- having to write papers on, among other things, why um, To Kill a Mockingbird is problematic because it's a white savior book. And, and I paid tens of thousands of dollars for her to be taught that crap. What can choice actually do versus what people think it can do? And like, what can't it do that you still think it's worth having it? Yeah. So, I mean, that's such a great question. And it's so weird. We have tended to talk about choice with like this really weird naivete for most of the last 30 years. I mean, especially at a place like AEI, it's so obvious. You know, when we don't talk about telecom choice or trucking choice or airline choice, it's deregulation. And once you, you know, you introduce choice by addressing bottlenecks, um, by thinking about, uh, how, you know, how do train, uh, how do the gauge of train rails, um, you know, match when they cross state lines? Cause this matters. You know, how many gates are available at airports? On all of this, there has been almost a, um, an intentional resistance to talking about these kinds of issues in school choice. When I have written about them over the decades, um, I've usually gotten a lot of grief. Funders have taken money away from like Chris DeMuth and Arthur Brooks because I wasn't with the team because they're like, you're, 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 you're muddying the narrative. Our job is choice good. And so part of the problem is these questions like, what does supply side formation look like? Um, just got absolutely back shelved over time. So w- what choice can do uh, is it can open doors. It can create opportunities for us to solve problems. And you know, given that most families of means already think about school when they buy their home, they've already exercised school choice. And then other affluent it, families. It, not to interrupt, but just even if they send their kids to public school by buying their home, they've done their school choice, right? Because they picked their school district. That's a property value in the Westchesters and Montgomery counties of the world. And in fact, even within those real estate agents will point out specific feeder patterns to any, you know, any uh, parent or prospective parent. And this is why that neighborhood costs more for the same house than this neighborhood. Um, so, there, so there's lots of families exercise choice already. School choice is really about the families who lack the economic clout um, or the social networks to have done that on the front end. And in that sense, this is why a lot of progressives can get behind the idea of school choice because it is equalizing access to decent schools. So. That does nothing about the about the ideological concerns that you alluded to. So, but that's one thing school choice can do. A second thing school choice can do, um, the school choice can't do, but educational choice can do, is it can create a system which allows families uh, to get what they think they need for their kids. So, school mm-hmm. districts uh, have to comply with federal um, ledger main around indiv- um, you know individual disabilities education act IDEA, and it's very pro- procedural and very uh, law driven. And a lot of families come away enormously frustrated. So one of the things you've seen, for instance, Jeb Bush pioneered when he was governor was voucher programs specifically targeted for kids with special needs. Because those families were like, we're just through with this. We want to find a school that actually wants to serve our kid. So you can do that kind of thing. Um, educational choice can also say over half of families coming out of the pandemic, over half of parents now say they'd like to have their kid learning at home at least one day a week. Um, they don't want to have, they don't want to homeschool but they like some of that visibility and, and relationship. Well, so there's things that are called like hybrid home schools, where your schools are in person for some. It's not school choice in a traditional sense. It's about creating new options. So what choice can do is it can start to move us towards an environment where families and school systems are no longer in one-size-fits-all mode, but are actually putting this stuff together in a way that works for kids. Career and technical education, um, you know, gifted opportunities, the rest. Now, on the ideological piece, um, the biggest problem here is that when uh, education was purple uh, in, in, a pretty, in a pretty meaningful way through, the Obama, through some point in the Obama years, starting during the Common Core fight and then uh, Michael, Brown, um, Michael Brown's death, uh, there was a divorce in the Ed reform world. And what happened was the blue team got custody of all, of all the crockery. 
So all of these establishments and networks and pipelines and everything else became unapologetically virtue, virtue signaling blue. And the private schools are part of those same communities. They go to the, they've got their conferences. They look to their same professional development materials. They look to the same publishers and trainers. And so all of them live in this world. School choice in the short term doesn't do anything about that. It can do something about that if you start to see the emergence of alternative schools of choice that are offering uh, a different valence. If you see the emergence of different networks of trainers and providers um, and educational choice, especially if it says, look, families can opt out of this civics class or that U.S. history class in favor of something sponsored by Ashbrook or something sponsored by Hoover or UChicago, and they can take that as a virtual alternative. And you are starting to see some of this. There's these Great Heart, the Great Hearts Charter Schools, for instance, in Arizona, um, have actually started to grow really substantially. They serve about 30,000 kids now. They're starting an online option. They've expanded to Texas. They're moving to Florida. And so you're starting to see a little bit of the si- supply side emergence, potentially. But we're way behind the eight ball compared to, you know, where, where we could have been if we had been thinking about these elements of it, you know, years or decades ago. You mentioned a couple of times in passing technical education. I can't remember what his, uh, our, our colleague Brent Orwell came, came down hard on me when I said something about technical education and vocational school or something. And I can't remember what his, his scolding was. So I'm, I'm speaking from a place of, of, of ignorance here, but you hear a lot about how the Germans are really good at that stuff. And maybe that was it as he said, that really isn't it's sort of a myth. I, I can't remember, but, um, is there a place? I mean, like, like, frankly, like uh, there are a lot, you know, plumbers make a good living. And with the, with the coming of AI, um, you're going to see a lot of piss poor and median lawyers and accountants saying I should have been in a plumber or an electrician. Does it, does it make sense to, you know, just not have, you know, normal high school, you know, maybe, maybe it's normal school through ninth grade. And then you're really going into essentially glorified shop. I mean, does, is it, does that make sense? And what, what, if so, what keeps us from doing that? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it certainly can make sense, right? Like we talked about earlier about how all these models can either work well or poorly. Certainly that's how some of these um, exam driven European nations do it, right? You think about like the British model or the French model where you give an exam and kids kind of, are going to go different ways based on that at some point in their teen years. That, that is a version of what the Germans do. Um, so absolutely, it, can, it seems like it can work. Um, there's, you know, an apprenticeship piece to this where that career and technical education can either happen in high schools, but it's hard to find, you know, licensed teachers who are great coders or great welders. It's a lot easier to find folks to do this professionally and hook up with them uh, through apprenticeship arrangements. Uh, that's challenging right now under a lot of kind of the operational code and collective bargaining agreements schools operate under, but that, that would work. Um, but you know, for us, the big problem in the U.S. is that all this overlays on all of our kind of racial divides, uh, and anxiety, you know, justifiable anxieties about these issues for most of kind of say the middle of the 20th century, vocational education from when it was introduced in like the 1920s, uh, through the 1970s, say, was the place where you would dump kids who were difficult to educate. Um, this could be low-income white kids. It could be particularly black and brown kids. And so we spent a half century doing that. And a lot of the efforts, say, a nation at risk to demand academic education for every child of at least this many units in high school was very much to try to push back against that tendency to, you know, funnel um, certain kids into this kind of like backwater track. Now, if we're talking about career and technical education today, we're talking about jobs where you're going to come out and make fifty or sixty thousand dollars with a high school diploma, working, you know, doing aircraft assembly, or that's a very different proposition. But how do you actually make sure that kids aren't getting kind of steered onto it, um, it, it you know, against their against their or their parents' will? How do you make sure the stuff's done well? Um, you know, that that's where that's where it gets really challenging. So, where do you come down on? Um, I mean, I have suspicions, but uh, 
you know, there are these increasing controversies about schools like Thomas Jefferson School for Science in Virginia, Stuyvesant in New York, um, about getting rid of these tests, which, you know, are the criteria which were for a long time ruthlessly objective, basically test scores, right? Um, because the disparate impact in terms of representation and equity and all that kind of stuff is becoming embarrassing for some of these schools, you never hear about one of the reasons why you get these disproportionate things is that all the other elite schools are working really hard to grab minority kids too. So it's not like, you know, they aren't landing someplace good. It's just that, you know, there are other places for them to go. Regardless, is there, is there a problem with having a, a couple citadels of, you know, what, you know, like Stuyvesant, I think had half the American Nobel prize winners um, went there. Um, is there a problem with having these kinds of schools that sort of siphon off the best of the best, of the best? Um, and if, if, if not, I mean, like how should those kinds of places deal with these kinds of issues? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think there's a problem. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I think true, um, citadels of merit are, are enormously important and healthy, uh, in a democratic nation. I mean, I, I, you know, these, these are, you know, these become the rate outs. Uh, where we can actually uh, defend things against kind of the leveling impulse. Um, and I think the way you do that is by using ruthlessly meritocratic um, criteria. Um, I, you know, you know, for instance, when you survey students, um, intelligent.com surveyed students about applying to selective colleges, 65% of students admitted they'd lied on their um, application in various ways. 30% had had fabricated letters of recommendation. 38% had somebody else write or help with their personal essay. So these other elements of merit, um, are, are frequently suspect. Um, you know, these, the, the, these assessments, I don't want to use them to judge somebody's moral worth. And I don't think we should use them to judge whether or not you get a high school diploma. But I think it's entirely appropriate to say, if we are going to run a specialized school in science and math, uh, you ought to demonstrate um, a, a, a extraordinary prepare, prepare, preparedness uh, when it comes to science and math. So the, the a lot of schools are dropping standardized test requirements for a lot of colleges are, right? I find it difficult to read it as anything other than anticipating where the Supreme Court's going to go and wanting to get out ahead of that and being able to retain the power to pick and choose the demographics of your campus as you see fit. There's a part of me as a conservative that says that's fine for institutions to be able to do that, but I'm not sure it's in the net aggregate good for the country um, if if our elite institutions behave that way. Is the SAT just sort of doomed, or is it just not going to matter anymore? I mean, it, so, so, there, 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 so <laughs> there's a couple of answers to this. One is, so these colleges are actually playing this uh, really odd game in which by going open admissions, um, and we'll see if this changes now, but by going functionally open admissions and then allowing students to send their test scores, uh, it, the, the, the college is played on both ends. They get more applicants, which drives down their acceptance rate, which makes them more prestigious and gets them a higher rank, say, in the U.S. Neuro, News and World Report rankings. And at the same time, their median test score goes up because they only are getting admissions from kids who did well. And that actually helps them in the rankings and competitive. So it was a little so, so, so there was a very self-interested game at work here in addition to the stuff. But look, um, on the one hand, um, I agree that uh, private entities have a right to allow into their membership whoever they wish. Um, on the other hand, I don't think they have the right to do it on the public's dime. And one of my grave concerns is these, uh, these elite institutions, which want to play games, which want to disregard traditional notions of merit and select based on, you know, race and ethnicity and, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, hard to define notions of empathy. Um, they want to do it while, while having their students take enormous federal loans to attend. They want to do it with federal Pell Grants. They want to do it while being underwritten by $50 billion in federal research funds that go to re uh, um, highly intensive research institutions. So my own stance, it was kind of, uh, this was actually what Justice Scalia offered up in those Michigan cases um, back at uh, Ruder and Gratz about 18 years ago, he said, look, colleges have a right to set clear expectations for qualification. What do you need to be able to come in and do the work here for University of Michigan undergrad or law school? 
um, and Harvard or Stanford or, you know, Oberlin have that right. But then he said, beyond that, they can hold a lottery. And institutions should have that option if they choose instead to want to have the right uh, to pick and choose based on non-transparent, uh, non-merit-based criteria, certainly they're right, but they should no longer be eligible for federal funds or for uh, other public subsidies because at this point they are operating as entities which are not in any way that I can understand uh, advancing kind of merit-based notions of the public wheel. Yeah, I got to say, the you have young kids. My daughter was applying to college during the pandemic, which um, was not fun. It's also very expensive. I have, I paid for a lot of common apps. And this is just a note to people who have kids coming up of that age. The constant hectoring my daughter would get emails, text messages, calls, letters, all that kind of stuff to apply to this school, to apply to that school, where you knew the school had no desire whatsoever to accept them and no an- anticipation that they would go. They just wanted to expand the base of applicants to say that they were more selective. Um, it's a real disservice to these kids because these kids are just like, they're, they're constantly being told this is the place you'll find true happiness and meaning in life. And like, you're not going to find that at any college, you know? Um, but uh, it was a pretty terrible experience during, particularly during COVID to see all that and see all the, the college essays, you know, the process and all that big picture. Are you, Hopeful? I mean, are you like, do you think things are going to get better in the short, medium term, or are they going to get worse? And the, the only way they get better is for them to continue to get worse. Um, <laughs> you know, I think on different days, I, I feel differently. I, I, I like to try to be moderately positive about this just because in American 2023, like it's easy enough uh, to be every other way. Um, you know, when you do your show on the Trump arrest, we can all deal with that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I do think this, um, that you are, that, that a lot of this stuff that gets, uh, lambasted in the mainstream media, parents concerned about the, the, you know, some of the, um, problematic books, you know, porn, problematic meaning pornography that show up in like middle school libraries, uh, parents showing up and running for school board aggressively, uh, some of the, um, you know, so some of, some, some of the over the line pushback on critical race theory, uh, or on some of the gender stuff, I actually find enormously, um, reassuring because I think one of the problems is for a lot of the no child left behind race, to the top era, parents really felt like education change was being done to them from on high. When you did focus groups, when you heard from parents, they were part of the huge frustration was they felt like they had been disinvited from the conversation. And I think what the pandemic did. All these parents over these kids' shoulders at the kitchen table, all these parents paying college tuition for kids who were watching professor for 30 minutes, you know, on a laptop in the basement. Um, there was a sense that, wait a minute, how the heck did we get here? And that creates a very different expectation, uh, and relationship to schools, uh, than I think we've had for, I don't know, the last quarter century. Um, I don't know how long lasting it will prove to be. Uh, I don't know how much real change can be, will manifest kind of before people kind of get back to other distractions. Um, but I think it creates an opportunity. And we've seen this with like this explosion of school choice, for instance. But I think it creates an opportunity um, for change that uh, goes more than kind of skin deep. And, um, you know, whether or not, whether or not that will come to fruition is a different question. But, I, you know, I, 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 you know, what the hell? Let's, uh, you know, roll up our sleeves and do our best and see what happens. Okay. Even though that was a great final answer to a final question, I do have one more question that just came to my head because we haven't talked about homeschooling really at all. And one of the things, so I taught this class years ago at Hillsdale for a little while and just for two weeks was a journalism thing. And it wasn't just that I was surprised at how many kids were homeschooled, um, had been homeschooled, um, something like 11% of the student body. Um, and part of that makes sense because if you're inclined to homeschool, you're much more going to be more sympathetic to sort of a Hillsdale type school than some other schools. And so I think that Hillsdale really benefited from some of the, the prejudice against homeschoolers at a lot of elite schools was their benefit. Um, but one of the things I hadn't really appreciated was 
the diversity of models for homeschooling. You know, why I imagine it is like the pandemic, just my kids home at a table. Uh, I don't want to do that, you know. Um, but it turns out there are a lot of different models. I'm sure you know this far better than I do. You know, kids rotate locations with other kids and a, a bunch of other things, and they produce kind of seemingly different kind of kids, it seems to me. But um, has there been any sort of methodological serious look at the performance of homeschooling? I mean, obviously, there's a selection bias. Only really committed parents are going to homeschool. As a as a as a rule, um, but uh, you know, what do we know about homeschoolers, and what does it say about you know the institutions that that they're exiting from? Yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, your point about the number of homeschoolers is, is a good one. There's about three million kids homeschooled, more or less, which is about six percent of school age population in the U.S. Um, it's about the same size as the entire charter school population. And much bigger than like the voucher school population. So folks, uh, you know, it's easy to lose track of. We don't actually have good research on this. The selection problems, the backbreaker. Um, there's a lot of good anecdotal evidence. Um, folks, some folks have tried to, you know, analyze this a little bit, but there's just no good way to compare apples to apples. Um, what you can't say is it seems that like lot, you know, there's lots of these three million kids who seem to do well, but it's hard to say anything more precise than that. The, uh, you know, one of, there's what, what's it mean about the schools? Obviously, and what's what's interesting is you get the homeschooling contingent comes from across the ideological spectrum. Uh, there's you know progressive parents who want to opt out of the system. There's conservative parents concerned about ideology. Uh, one of the big opportunities here, looking forward, is to the extent that you start to see these more universal school choice systems, so universal vouchers uh, or education savings accounts. Um, and that you start to see these innovations like micro schools, where it's a teacher and 15 kids, kind of a big learning pod that we saw during the pandemic. Um, that starts to potentially bring more of these homeschool families into something that's more um, adjacent to the system and less isolated. And you were asking about that critical mass. How do you start to get options that feel like they're intended to serve uh, parents who don't want to buy the kind of the woke kind of uh, you know, agenda, you potentially start to see more of these things surface in a more formalized way that families will be able to find and plug into options which are more explicitly traditional or conservative in their orientation. Um, again, it may or may not go that way, but y there's a possibility there that I would not have said was realistic, you know, four years ago. I mean, the, the thing I take away from all of this is it's sort of Adam Smith's famous line, there's a lot of ruin in a nation, right? You can have, if you're looking, if you're, if you're going to argue by anecdote, American education, you can make the case American education has never been better. And you can make the case it's never been worse because it's just too big a universe with too many competing trends going on all at once to, to have a one size fits all unified field theory explanation for any of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's right. And that's, you know, and this is the, the frustration for, you know, we've had so many, uh, you know, well-intended folks who've tried to drive improvement on this from Washington. And, you know, one of the things that they all encounter is, you know, it's just this really convoluted game of telephone where they're trying to give directions to, you know, 50 state education agencies plus a handful of others, D.C. and other, and then it's going down to school districts and then it's going down to schools and then it's going down to classrooms. And, you know, whether it was, uh, you know, Rod Page or Arnie Duncan, or, you know, or Betsy DeVos, um, the degree to which they felt like what, what people told them they were trying to do felt so utterly removed from what they were trying to do and what they thought they, they, what they, thought they were sending out. Um, it's just a reminder that, you know, at the end of the day, if we are going to fundamentally transform this stuff, it's probably not going to be done by somebody swooping into the beltway. Um, it's going to have to be harder and messier and more Tocquevillian. All right. With that, Rick Hess, the book is The Great School Rethink, a Reimagining K-12 Education After the Pandemic. Thanks so much for coming on. Hey, hey pleasure to be on. Thanks for having me. Okay. So uh, Rick Hess has left the uh, studio. Um, I Again, I apologize to him before we started recording. I apologize to him while we were recording, and I will apologize to him again. should have had him on here a long time ago. Um, 
Um, I think he's great. I think I was, he was, we were, he was just asking me how he did before he disappeared. And I said, I thought he did really well. And I, one of the things I really like about him, which is very much in the tradition of James Q. Wilson, who was arguably one of the greatest social scientists of the last half century. Um, one of the things I like about Rick's approach is he has strong opinions about what people, sh- what, what should be done, but also has a certain amount of humility and skepticism about anything being, um, a silver bullet solution. And then, you know, this stuff is hard and you can know what's right in one instance and still have a problem transferring it to someplace else. But anyway, people let me know what you think, what you thought about it in the comments. I have many thoughts, but I'll save them for the solo. If I can remember or sober up or whatever. Um, and, uh, again, uh, I have no idea what's happened with the arraignment for all I know. America is, um, fighting hammers and tongs with broken bottles in the streets of Miami and all the major cities, except for the area around my hotel in Houston. I suspect not. Um, and, um, we will obviously have all the punditry you need on that stuff in the days and weeks ahead. If you could become a subscriber to the dispatch, that would be awesome. Um, and if you can't, we understand, but it makes us sad. So with that, I'll see you next time. No, you won't. This is a podcast.